Test one, two, three. Ready to go? Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the January Speakers Night of the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, I'm the President, Ralph Chu, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our first meeting of 2019. Uh, tonight, we have a uh, uh, talk on uh, the New Horizons mission and uh, this is actually Paul Delaney's swan song for this year because he's starting a sabbatical and uh, next week he'll be on his way to Australia via Arizona and a couple of other places for the next six months. So this is our last chance to hear from him before he uh, takes off. So without further ado, I'll ask Paul to deliver his talk on New Horizons, the continuing mission. Thank you very much, Ralph. Just make sure I've got all the right bits and pieces here from our technical crowd. So I do, indeed. Thank you very much, indeed. Uh, so yes, we'll be departing for warmer climes uh, very shortly. <laughs> no apologies. Uh, and I will see you all again <laughs> come September. But uh, in between time, of course, you know, we all had a lot of interest over the New Year's for a variety of reasons, but including the New Horizons flyby of Ultima Thule. Uh, it certainly captivated the imagination of amateur astronomers, amateur space enthusiasts, the public alike. So it seemed to be a very fitting moment in time to bring you up to speed on what we found out with the flyby and in fact uh, where we're hoping to go hereafter. Hence, the New Horizons continuing mission. But of course, to have a continuing mission, I'm going to certainly work my way back to the beginning when it was launched in 2006, talk to you a little bit about the background of how the New Horizons mission came into existence, uh, the flyby of Pluto in 2015, and then, of course, Ultima Thule you know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, first off, the ad, uh, my current employer likes me to tell you a little bit about what's happening up at the university. So for those of you who aren't aware, every Wednesday night we have public viewing opportunities at the university. Currently we're on the Arboretum Arcade. Uh, and every Monday night we also have 
online public viewing experiences. That is to say, from the warmth and comfort of your own home, you are have you you have the opportunity to tune in, see what the telescopes are looking at, and listen to us live on uh, Astronomy.fm, the York Universe production, which I host along with uh, various graduate and undergraduate students. So you can really get your fill, shall we say, of what we're up to. Uh, we have 40 centimeter, 60 centimeter telescopes, and very soon a one meter telescope. Yes, it was supposed to be here by now, but this will come as a huge surprise to you. The schedule slipped a little bit, uh, and as a consequence, it's now not going to be installed until the beginning of July. Yes, my staff are bitterly disappointed. They were hoping to get lots and lots of wonderful observing in with me out of the picture. Ain't gonna happen. Uh, so anyway, the beginning of July, unfortunately, just beyond the General Assembly, which is at York this year. You're going to miss the one meter at the General Assembly by about two weeks. Uh, hopefully Randy won't mind me saying that on air. Uh, but uh, certainly the beginning of July, we're expecting it to be put in place. And thereafter, probably within two weeks of the installation, it will become our primary tool for public viewing. So Wednesday nights, you'll have the opportunity to come up, have a look through a one meter class telescope. Okay, so things are happening. Okay, <laughs> not this Pluto. Okay, but the main reason that New Horizons came into existence was to journey to the outer reaches of our solar system and investigate at that moment in time the planet Pluto. We'll talk a little bit about what happened with that definition, that designation shortly, but the whole aim of the New Horizons mission was to literally go where no one had gone before, to be able to go out and examine the outer reaches of our solar system and the then ninth planet. So not this guy. Okay. Ah, here we go. Why planet number nine? Well, of course, at the beginning of the 20th century, Percival Lovell was absolutely convinced that there had to be a planet number nine for a variety of differing reasons, most of them not correct. You might recall that we found planet Neptune courtesy of gravitational perturbations of the planet Uranus in its orbit around the sun. Mathematicians went to work with Newtonian mechanics figured out where Neptune needed to be, and then in 1846 we actually went ahead and found Neptune more or less exactly where it should have been based upon mathematical calculations. Everybody got really excited over this notion and thought, aha, let's go find the ninth planet this way. And there are all sorts of fits and starts and, you know, it, it just never happened that way, so as to speak. But, you know, we had eight planets, there was no magic about eight, therefore there was an expectation that nine was going to happen. And so Percival Lovell commissioned that study. He died long before it actually came to uh, fruition, but Clyde Tambow hired in 1929 Flagstaff Observatory in Arizona was successful within about a year of the commencement of his search for Pluto. He found Pluto in 1930. He was looking for a planet, so therefore, obviously, when he found this object, it had to be a planet. There was no definition, the nomenclature that defined the word planet didn't exist. We all knew what a planet was, therefore, when we found Pluto, the object that we were looking for as planet number nine, it had to be a planet. It was Clyde Tambow's ability as an observer, underscore, an observer. There was no accurate calculation. There was no mathematics associated with it, with the finding of the location for Pluto. It was his ability to look at literally thousands of images on glass plates every single night do, using a process called blink comparison that eventually found Pluto. So it was, it was observing prowess, nothing to do with mathematics, that gave rise to the discovery of then planet Pluto. Okay, Pluto, as I said, you know, we were looking for it. There was no real idea associated with its mass at that point in time. And so as you can see, the expectation initially was it was, oh, I don't know, 10 times the mass of the Earth. As near as I can gather from my investigations of it, it was a number that, you know, there was a dartboard in somebody's office and they were throwing, because there was nothing associated with the observation that suggested Pluto had that much of a mass. And as you can see, in very short order, that 10 Earth mass, or 15 Earth mass, began to shrink, okay? And by the time we got to 1978, just prior to the discovery of Pluto's large satellite, Charon, 
the size of Pluto had continued to shrink. Pluto's, sorry, the discovery of Pluto's moon, Charon, allowed us to use Keplerian mechanics, two objects orbiting about each other. You can measure the orbital period, you can measure their separation, and voila, we are now able to determine the mass of the Pluto Charon system. And as you can see, Pluto ended up being a whole lot lighter, a whole lot less massive than we had originally anticipated some you know, 40, 50 years prior. So we've now got ourselves planet number nine. We still haven't defined what a planet is, but we still are calling Pluto a planet, and it's got a satellite which is fully half the size of Pluto orbiting about it. In fact, the pluto charon system is often referred to as sort of a binary world type pair. They are that similar in size, diameter, and mass, and they are really very, very close to each other. What did we know about Pluto before the advent of New Horizons? Well, this sort of sums it up, length, breadth, everything, okay? There wasn't much else that was known about this object. Its orbital characteristics, how far away it was from the sun, how long it took to orbit around the sun, and as a consequence, its temperature, yeah, that was all pretty easy to observe, to measure. And as you can see, it is a long way out. On average, it's about 40 times the Earth-Sun distance. But its orbit is quite eccentric. And even from the earliest days, many astronomers looked at the orbital characteristics of Pluto and said, hmm, doesn't much look like the other planets in our solar system from a purely dynamical perspective. That is to say, most of the orbits around the Sun are pretty circular. Pluto's is not. Most of them are in the same plane, what we call the ecliptic plane. Pluto has a great degree of inclination. And so from the outset, people wondered whether or not Pluto really was in the same category as the other planets in our solar system. Nonetheless, we continue to call it a planet right to the bitter end of the 20th century. Just to give you size comparisons, okay, Ceres is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. You see Pluto and you see our moon. So it's a pretty small object when all is said and done. And as a consequence, there really wasn't great expectations with respect to what we were going to find there. The other planets in our solar system, which by the end of the 1980s we had visited, so the other eight, if you will, including Earth, had all been visited, because of their relatively warm environments, their massive sizes, things like tidal heating, there was a degree of dynamicness associated with all those objects. Pluto, where it was located, truly out in the middle of nowhere, darn cold, very small, there weren't high hopes that it was going to be a particularly interesting world. But that said, there were still those of us in the astronomical community who wanted to go and investigate it because it was obviously the next major target as far as the exploration of the solar system was concerned. And so people started talking about heading off to Pluto and checking things out as early as in the 1970s. Okay, well, where is Pluto? Let's think a little bit about that part of the solar system. You're all probably somewhat familiar with the inner solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. These are all rocky worlds, what we call terrestrial planets, relatively close to the sun, meaning that we're pretty warm. And then you get out beyond the asteroid belt and you have the Jovian planets, the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. All of those characteristics talk to us about the differences in the regions of our solar system. Pluto is out in an area that is truly quite remote and quite different compared to those other locations. And so we're talking about the Kuiper Belt. Think of the Kuiper Belt as an expanded area of an asteroid belt. Between Mars and Jupiter, we have the asteroid belt, sort of between two and five astronomical units from the Sun. Remember, an astronomical unit, the average distance the Earth is from the Sun. The asteroid belt has hundreds of thousands, probably millions, of very tiny particles. Most of them are really very, very small, but there are some, like Ceres, that are nearly a thousand kilometers in diameter. So it's a rubble heap, if you will, that orbits between Mars and Jupiter. You put all that stuff together, by the way, add it all up, what's its mass? Considerably less than 1% the mass of our moon. So there's a lot of stuff there, but 
only in particle number, not in total mass. Take that region and now slip out to the Pluto orbit, out around about 40 to 50 astronomical units from the Sun. This region became quite interesting as far as the astronomical community was concerned during the 1940s and the 1950s, when particularly Gerald Kuiper began to examine this area and suggested that it was a region that would bear similarity to the asteroid belt. Much larger diameter because of the distance that region was from the Sun, but the expectation was that there was going to be a lot of stuff out there. His predictions turned out to be quite true because excluding Pluto, we found our first member of the Kuiper belt in 1992. And since then, we've found literally thousands of objects. Some of them are quite large, as in a thousand kilometers or more in diameter. Many are considerably smaller. But it is a region that in many ways you can think of as the asteroid belt, but much further out. So Pluto hangs out in this region. And so as we were beginning to find these objects, the natural question that was being asked is, is Pluto really a planet, or is it just another member of the Kuiper belt? Was it a Kuiper belt object? Or you know, could you have a sort of a foot in both camps? As we said, expectations were high as far as the total number of objects in the, in the Kuiper belt. Hundreds of billions of objects was the expectation, but because this stuff is so far away, it's relatively faint. Remember, most objects in our solar system, with the exception of the sun in fact, shine by reflected light. They are dirty mirrors. Our moon, it might look bright, but it is only reflecting about 8% of the light incident on its surface, and it's still very bright. By the time you get out to 40 astronomical units, the amount of sunlight is very, very weak. And when you've got really dusty surfaces on objects that are quite small in radius, then there's not much area to reflect light. Finding Kuiper Belt objects, they're moving slowly, they're very dim, it's really hard. But nonetheless, the search has been ongoing with increasing intensity, if you will, since the early 1990s. Okay, so now the question arises. Okay, if we've got lots of objects out there in the Kuiper Belt, is it possible that there'll be other objects that are comparable in size, if not larger, than Pluto? And now the question was being seriously asked in coffee shops and corner water coolers uh, all across the astronomical world, what really is a planet? Is Pluto really definable as a planet? And so through the 1990s, this question became ever more prevalent, shall we say. And then in 2003, an object was found that, at least initially, was believed to be larger than Pluto. And now, it was almost panic within the astronomical community because if we've got one object that is larger than Pluto, there might be many more. And heaven forbid, perhaps our solar system has 10, 20, or 30 planets. Personally, I don't see what the issue is, but nonetheless, given the fact that we'd had nine up until this point in time, the idea of going double digits seemed to be problematic as far as astronomers were concerned. And so now the question was, let's define a planet. How do we define a planet? And so the international astronomical community formed, like any good bureaucracy, about 19 subcommittees over three years to discuss the issue. And they brought their findings to the 2006 IAU Congress. And the recommendation was promptly thrown out. OK, well, we've got a vote on the floor tomorrow. We need to vote on something. And so everybody huddled behind closed doors in 2006 at the Prague meeting and came up with a new definition. So 19 committees, three years, whatever, forget all that. Let's figure it out in 12 hours behind a couple of closed doors. And here is the definition that we're going to conclude is a planet. It has to orbit the sun. I dare say that one didn't take them very long to figure out. It's in hydrostatic equilibrium. That is to say, it's big enough that during formation, it will become spherical. That is to say, it's got enough self-gravity to pull itself into this sort of minimum energy state, and that is, nominally speaking, spherical. The third definition was it had to dominate its 
orbital path around the sun. That is to say, it was the gravitational kingpin in its orbit around the sun. Those were the three criteria that any object had to fulfill to be called a planet. Now, I'm just going to give you a quick teaser here. 12 years later, this is still a highly contentious definition. If you really want to get planetary astronomers to go at each other, just ask them about the definition of a planet, okay? And stand back. Anyway, this is the official definition. And as a consequence of that definition, Pluto failed the third criteria. It does not gravitationally govern its orbital path around the sun. In fact, it's in a three to two orbital resonance with Neptune. Neptune governs Pluto's orbital path. Forget about the fact that there's all sorts of stuff flying backwards and forwards across Pluto's orbit. Pluto is sufficiently minuscule in this regard that its gravitational um, pull, shall we say, <laughs> is very, very small. So bottom line to it is it doesn't dominate its own path. So in August of 2006, Pluto fell from the planetary club and it was demoted to being called a dwarf planet. Okay, Pluto hasn't changed, by the way. Okay, just because we changed its definition and its title didn't mean that the planet, the object, changed. Despite the fact that somebody actually seriously suggested that we had just launched New Horizons, as you'll see in a moment, that maybe, just maybe, New Horizons shouldn't go there after all. And it's on its way. Okay, fine. I don't really understand that one at all. As I say, it was a sad day, and we have people all around the world who continue to lament the demise of Pluto from the Planetary Club. One of my current student observers uses Pluto at every opportunity in her Twitter name, in her email feed. Uh, you don't want to have the conversation with her about Pluto not being in the Planetary Club. Okay, so here is the solar system as we now perceive it three zones. The inner solar system, which is where the terrestrial planets are, the uh, second zone, which is more or less where the Jovian planets are, and then the Kuiper belt that contains dwarf planet Pluto out here in the third zone, if you will, or the third region of our solar system, the modern reality. Just to give you perspective, here is, if you will, a global view of our solar system. The Oort cloud is a huge region out to about 50,000 astronomical units that surrounds our solar system as we move around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Has truly billions and billions, probably in fact trillions, of cometary nuclei just sitting there sort of buzzing around leftover material from the formation of our solar system and periodically as in annually several dozen of these cometary nuclei get perturbed either from self-interactions or passing stars and they rain down towards the inner solar system bearing in mind where they are of course it takes a long time for them to swing in but they do they swing in past the Kuiper belt past the region of the planets and into the inner solar system but you can see just on the scale here how truly enormous the region surrounding our sun is as far as your cloud is concerned and by comparison how relatively small the Kuiper belt region is Nonetheless, it is a region that we have not explored very much, and that is steadily changing, courtesy of New Horizons. In general terms, all of the material that exists beyond the orbit of Neptune, and that includes Pluto, are referred to as trans-Neptunian objects. There's a lot of nomenclature, Kuiper Belt objects, trans-Newtonian objects, Plutonans, uh, they're all in reference to the objects that are out beyond the orbit of Neptune. And here's just a smattering of some of them. The one on the top right, Eris, is what sort of catapulted the discussion about Pluto, planetary definitions and so on, into really sharp focus. Mike Brown uh, found Eris in 2003. Uh, it was named in 2005. And you've probably read that book of, um, of Mike Brown. And I, I, the title was something like, you know, How I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming to It, or something along those lines. I, I probably murdered the title slightly. Uh, but he is, as it works out, one of the principal astronomers who's looking hard for the replacement for planet number nine. And now we put it as N-I-N-E, not as numeral nine. But uh, yeah, 
it's an interesting saga of the last 10 years in this regard. But you can see the, uh, the range of objects, and this is all true to size. So Eris, as it works out, is basically a few kilometers less in diameter than Pluto, despite the fact that we first initially thought it was larger. But those are the largest of the Kuiper Belt objects that are out there. Both are dwarf planets, and then there's a number of other ones out there. And you'll also notice that a lot of these dwarf planets, these Kuiper Belt objects, when they're reasonably large, as in 1,000, 1,500 kilometers, actually have their own satellites with them. Gravitational interaction, captures, and so on. Okay, so number of differing types of Kuiper Belt objects, just to really you know, put the icing on the cake. The classical cold KBOs, nothing to do with temperature, has everything to do with their orbits around the sun. They're basically circular orbits. They seem to be unperturbed, and they more or less lie very close to the ecliptic plane. Okay, So those are the classical KBOs. Then we've got the hot classical KBOs, and as that name sort of suggests, they have been perturbed for one reason or another. Their orbital eccentricities are much higher. Their inclinations are much higher. So two distinct populations of objects out there in the 42 to 48 astronomical unit uh, uh, range. Then we've got the resonant KBOs. These are the ones where Neptune has really played a significant and ongoing role. As I said, Pluto is in a 3 to 2 orbital resonance with Neptune, so it falls into this category. But there's all sorts of other objects out there that are in 2 to 1 resonances, 4 to 3 resonance, and so on. And when we say 3 to 2, basically three orbits around the sun for Neptune is exactly equal to two orbits around the sun for Pluto, a three to two resonance. When you look at our own moon, it's in a one-to-one -one spin orbit resonance around the Earth. It spins on its axis exactly the same rate as it moves around the Earth. Of course, the net effect of that is a tidal locking where the same face of the moon is towards the Earth at all times. So, these types of resonance, these gravitational engagements, are all over the solar system, and particularly out here in the uh, Kuiper Belt. And then you've got scattered KBOs, which are objects which have flown too close, moved too close to Neptune, and have been scattered uh, away from the sort of the classical regions. They have really high eccentricities and high inclinations, and as the name suggests, you know, a very broad range of both of those characteristics. So. Kuiper Belt objects, that region in the outer solar system has become an area of intense observation over the last 20 to 25 years. So when we start talking about a mission to Pluto, we're not just talking about going out to Pluto. We're talking about checking out this region at large. And so, as I said, we were thinking of objects, um, sorry, of spacecraft as early as the 1970s to venture out there. The Voyager spacecraft, the Grand Tour, Jupiter and Saturn, and then if everything went well, on to, quote, Uranus, Neptune, and potentially Pluto. However, never made it to Pluto. Voyager 1 was going to be the vehicle after it went by Saturn to head on out. But Voyager 1's orbital trajectory was modified to give us an up-close and personal view of Titan. And the moment we went to Titan, Voyager 1's ability to reach any of the other outer planets had been lost, so it couldn't get to Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto after the decision was made to fly close to Titan. Voyager 2 was retargeted not uh, to look at uh, Titan, but it was deliberately retargeted onto Uranus and Neptune. But we lost the opportunity for Pluto when we swapped it for Titan. From there, the mid-70s through to the beginning of the 21st century, there are all sorts of stops and starts as far as a Pluto Express was concerned. We tried on many occasions to get a spacecraft heading in that direction to look at the outer solar system, but the bottom line to it is it never really carried enough weight and budgetary constraints seemed to always nix the opportunity to create a Pluto-bound spacecraft. That happened all the way through to around about 2003 when there was enough momentum, if you will, from the astronomical community to actually get the budgetary funding through for a 
very lightweight spacecraft that would fly out to Pluto very, very quickly. And there was some degree of urgency, we thought, because there was a suspicion that as Pluto moved further from the sun, it would end up freezing out its atmosphere. And it, because its orbit is 248 years, it would be a long time before that atmosphere <laughs> redeveloped. And so if we didn't go now, then we would lose that opportunity. So those arguments probably played into our ability to get New Horizons funded. This was the spacecraft that was designed. As I say, it was on a bit of a shoestring budget. Uh, it was not the uh, most sophisticated probe out there when you compare it to the Voyager spacecraft, for example. New Horizons is quite lightweight, but it has all that we need. It's got spectroscopes, it's got images, it's got dust samplers, it's got radiation detectors and so on, radio science options. It was enough that would it, it, it contained enough that we would be more than able to examine Pluto and have a good look around the outer solar system. And so New Horizons was thrown together in fairly short order. I draw your attention to, I, let's see here, no, I, middle? Ah, right. Look familiar? <laughs> Anybody remember the Jackie Gleason and the Honeymooners? Okay. Unlike most NASA words, they're acronyms for things that you can't possibly ever remember. Okay, and that goes for these things. But Alice and Ralph are not acronyms. They really are the Honeymooners. Okay. So uh, the, the the other interesting thing about New Horizons is that the dish, the main antenna, is integrally associated with the instrumentation, such that if the instruments are pointing towards a target, the dish has no independence to point back towards the Earth. So once you're doing one thing, if you're not pointing towards the Earth, that's that. You've got to carry on with your science, and then when you finish your science, then you reorient the entire spacecraft so that the dish can point towards Earth. Starkly different, for example, to the Voyager spacecraft where the instruments tended to be on a boom, and so you could be doing instrumentation observations and have the antenna pointed towards the Earth at the same time. As I said, this was a bit of a low-budget mission in the grand scheme of things, thrown together very quickly. This was one of the shortcuts, but you know, it just means that the spacecraft has to be quite autonomous doing its science, and we have to sit back here and just wait for it to finish. It was launched in 2006. We're almost coming up on the 13th anniversary of the launch. It was the fastest spacecraft we ever launched. It was uh, traveling at about 53,000 kilometers an hour with respect to the sun when it left Earth orbit. Low mass, and we put it on board the Atlas IV heavy configuration, and it literally shot away from the planet. See how quickly it got to Jupiter went to Jupiter for a gravity assist barely a year later. For those of you who remember how long it took Juno and Galileo to get to Jupiter, you know, drool, because this was there in nothing flat. So the spacecraft was sent out as quickly as we possibly could. It picked up a gravity assist with Jupiter, picked up about four, kilo, uh, four uh, kilometers per second in speed, and then was sent on its journey. And even with that terrific speed, it was still gonna take nine plus years, nine and a half years to get out to Pluto. After that uh, February gravity assist, basically the spacecraft went into hibernation mode for the better part of the next sort of eight years and woke up in the January of 2015. The image on the left represents the Hubble Space Telescope's best view of Pluto. Yeah, okay, enough said. <laughs> the one on the right is the image that New Horizons was able to generate. And I think you will agree that there is a huge improvement in the quality of what we could see. I mean, Hubble you know, is a great instrument, but Pluto is still relatively small, less than 2,400 kilometers, and it is on average 40 times the Earth-Sun distance. It's a long way away. Uh, but this shows you the power of being there. This was the image that um, uh, you know, became quite well known everywhere. This is the Pluto heart. Okay, this is uh, Sputnik plenum, the orangey material, tholin deposition, uh, complex hydrocarbons that rain down through the atmosphere of Pluto onto the planetary surface. Sputnik plenum is basically a huge glacier of nitrogen ice. The biggest surprise, if you will, 
about the Pluto encounter is the array of geology that exists on Pluto. For a tiny little world that has an average daytime temperature of about minus 225 Celsius, this world has a phenomenal amount happening. Cryovolcanism, uh, nitrogen ice glaciers, mountain peaks, Tholen deposition structure in the atmosphere that we didn't really expect at all. And here you can just see, so, oops, sorry. Try that again, Paul. You can see the variety of uh, discoveries that were made by New Horizons as it flashed by Pluto at a distance of about 13,500 kilometers in July of 2015, moving uh, again at tens of thousands, nearly 52,000 kilometers per hour. So it was quite the uh, success. Two days worth of intense observation where we did not listen to the probe at all. It was doing all of its pre-programmed activity. And then at the end of that period, it basically turned itself around and said, hi, it's all good. Uh, and of course, you know, at that point in time, there were people who hadn't slept for about two days worrying. New Horizons, fun fact, only went into safe mode twice in its first 10 years of operation. That's actually pretty unheard of for spacecraft. In safe mode where something has gone wrong and the computer has said, okay, I'm just going to wait until you tell me what to do next. You know, that happens reasonably frequently. Twice in 10 years is really quite amazing. One of those safing mode events occurred in early July of 2015, less than two weeks before the actual encounter. But they recovered from it. <laughs> Okay, just a couple of quickie images here. You can certainly see the uh, structures associated with the ice as it's butting up against the uh, uh, terrain that surrounds the very flat area of uh, Sputnik Plenum. Looking at the edge, the Tarsus region, these are mountain regions. Uh, there's a lot of activity going on here, uh, running along the edge, a series of what looks like sand dunes, except that they're probably icy dunes, not sand dunes, uh, with uh, altitudes that are hundreds of meters high. Looking back over the Terminator, you can see the structure in the atmosphere. It's a very thin atmosphere, don't get me wrong. There's not much of an atmosphere there. It truly is much thinner than even the Martian atmosphere. But the structure in the atmosphere was quite surprising, and you can certainly see that structure here. They've exaggerated it, of course, uh, with uh, image processing, but there was no doubt that this was not expected, and the amount of photochemistry that is happening in the atmosphere also was a surprise. Those reddish regions that are both on Pluto and Chiron arise from the atmosphere rich in methane and nitrogen interacting with ultraviolet photons from the sun, breaking down, reforming, and then literally distilling out onto the, uh, the surface of the planet, uh, on the surface of the world. Uh, and here, yeah, I keep calling it a planet, uh, and here you can see some of that atmosphere here again. So the Pluto flyby by any measure in July of 2015 was a stunning success. Over the sort of 80 years from 1930 when Clyde Tambow found Pluto to when we slipped by with New Horizons, this is the sequence of how Pluto has changed from the highest resolution images, New Horizon, to the early discovery images stopping off as we came closer and closer to the encounter. So it was one of those real success stories where Pluto was nothing more than a point of light on Clyde Tambow's images in 1930 through to becoming a real world with New Horizons in 2015. Well, New Horizons was such a success, was in such good health that even before the encounter with Pluto, people were saying, okay, now what? What can we do with this spacecraft after we fly by Pluto? We're in a region of the solar system we've never been before. It's a region of the solar system we're probably not going to get to again anytime soon. Let's take full advantage of a healthy spacecraft and let's do something else. So that's basically what we did. For 20 months, the first sort of, uh, sorry, for the first 15 months after the flyby, the prime objective was to get the data back down. It was something like 50 gigabytes of data that were collected in the 48 hours around closest approach to Pluto. At the 
huge rate of one kilobit per second, it takes a long time to get the data. And none of the mission scientists had fingernails for the next 15 months, waiting for all of that data to come back down and be received safely here on Earth. It was transmitted twice. There was redundancy on the spacecraft. But you're in a region of the solar system you've never been before. You got to smacked into something and never known about it. So this is why that 15 months was a really, really uh, challenging period of time. But nonetheless, it all came back down quite happily. We knew we had in excess of 35 kilograms of onboard fuel, meaning that there was a delta V correction, a change in the velocity of the spacecraft that we could have initiated, providing there was something more or less on the flight path of New Horizons. And so the search started in 2014 to actually go and find an object. And it was the Hubble Space Telescope that was charged with going to find it. Because we'd been searching since about 2011 with ground-based facilities to find something that New Horizons could look at. And we hadn't found anything. And so we eventually subscribed to time on Hubble. And in 2014, June in fact, they found what worked out to be the object of choice. There were several objects found by Hubble, but 2014 MU69, which was renamed Ultima Thule, uh, sorry, Ultima Thule, was the object of choice. So it was Hubble that found that. In 2017, there was an occultation observation, and this is a game where pro professional amateur astronomers get together and several observing groups across South America observed the occultation of this object, MU69, in front of a star and were able to actually measure out what we thought would be the shape of Ultima Thule. Ultima Thule, by the way, stands for Beyond the Known World or in Australian vernacular, Outback of Beyond. It's out in the middle of nowhere. So this was the occultation measurement that was made, and for those of you who have never engaged in occultation observations, strongly recommend that you do. Uh, it's a series of people who are scattered in latitude as the star is occulted by an intervening object. In this case, it was a Kuiper Belt object, MU69. And depending upon the shape of the object that is occulting the star, so too will each individual observer see the star disappear for differing lengths of time. And so you can see here cuts through the object by observers. And for this period of time, from here to here, from here to here, and so on, the star winks out. And by picking up all of those cuts, you can actually figure out what the... You can... Right, try that again. I hate this little thing. Uh, <laughs> you can figure out the shape of the intervening object. This worked out to be absolutely dead on. So we knew more or less what Ultima Thule was going to look like when we finally observed it, still two years, roughly speaking, into the future. Okay, this was the image taken 24 hours before closest approach. It, it sort of reminds me of Hubble's image of Pluto, nothing to write home about. However, you can see that the object in question is obviously highly elongated. And so that speculation, the speculation was either it was a double object, a double lobed object, weren't really quite sure what was going on, but it was obviously not spherical. We finally figured out what was going on uh, when we were observing this object photometrically, it wasn't changing much. That is to say, over a period of hours, the light intensity from Ultima Thule wasn't changing. That, that suggested a couple of unusual questions, because if you've got an object that is highly elongated and it was rotating about an axis, then theoretically the cross-section that you would see from the spacecraft should change quite significant during one rotation period, which means the amount of light reflected off of it that you see should have changed, but it wasn't. And the reason for that is that, as it works out, New Horizons was approaching Ultima Thule right down its rotation axis. And so there was no real change in the cross-sectional area that we were looking at. So you know, how often is that going to happen that you're going to fly straight down the rotation axis of an object? But at any rate, 
This was the object that we were expecting to find based upon occultation measurements, and given the fact that there was no variation in the light intensity uh, of the object, they were able to determine that, in fact, this was the rotation axis. And then, of course, on New Year's morning, around about 12.33, and I dare say there were several people in this room who were watching, uh, the actual closest approach took place. Now, unlike Pluto, where sort of Pluto filled our field of view for quite a number of days beforehand, and then we slipped by the planet and it still filled our field of view for a long time. Pluto was 2,500 kilometers in diameter after all. Ultima Thule is only, as you can see, about 30 kilometers, give or take. Spacecraft is moving at 52,000 kilometers an hour. Basically, the closest approach was something like this. And that was that. Okay? And so all of the, the, the imagery had to be taken very, very quickly. It was all auto sequence because, of course, we couldn't talk to the spacecraft. It was doing its thing. The antenna was away. So it was all on remote control. It was all AI control. But when you think about it, the fact that it was such a small object and we were able to get imagery like this, like this, is really quite amazing. So here's your double lobed structure that we were suspicious was going to happen. Uh, astronomers don't always have a, a, a great um, repertoire of names, so they said this is Ultima, this is Thule, okay, for Ultima Thule, and you know it's about 20 kilometers across here, but you can already see a little bit of detail in this object. So this is not the highest resolution image, but when they looked at it, of course, New Year's, Christmas, okay, it's the snowman. So that's where the word snowman came from. I draw your attention to this brighter ring or neck of material here. We'll talk about that in just a second. But this was the object that we saw literally just a few tens of minutes before closest approach. Okay, now if you watch this and if it begins to make you sick, stop. But there's a couple of images here taken only minutes apart, but showing you a huge change in resolution just over the span of a few minutes because, as I said, the spacecraft was moving so quickly and the object is so small, even a small difference in time makes a big difference in resolution. But you can still nonetheless see this very bright region here. This is the neck where the two objects are joining, and we'll show you an animation in a moment of probably how they formed. But this is probably icy material that has rolled down literally from both the spherical masses, Ultima and Thule, over the course of time. There is definitely some surface relief, whether or not these are real craters or not. We're still waiting for all of the imagery to come back. So the color is very similar to other Kuiper Belt objects. That is to say, it's a decided rusty red-brown, if you will. Uh, the compositional information we will know, but we don't know yet. Literally, the spacecraft flew by Ultima Thule on New Year's Day, and three days later, the object went into conjunction with the sun which basically means that the sun got in between Earth and New Horizons. And we can't transmit through the sun. It's just too bright an object in the radio. And so after literally less than 1% of the data download, we had to stop and wait. It has now resumed, but uh, there's been no new imagery that I'm aware of uh, that has been released. But that, that might have changed in the last 24 hours. But we are now waiting for the rest of the data download, which is going to take now not 15 months, but 20 months, because of course we're still further out. So yes, this is real color. To give you an idea of size, this is Chiron over here. So this is Pluto's satellite. You'll notice that the same Tholen comp uh, coloration on the surface. This is not, we believe, associated with organic material. Uh, but again, we need to wait and see. Again, just to show you the sequence that's associated with approach and how this object was rotating. It rotates about once every 15 hours, give or take. And again, as we're approaching Ultima Thule with the spacecraft, just look down here, you know, it's very, very short period of time, less than a day. We go from not much more than a smudge, shall we say, to a real world that has, you know, features that we will be able to examine. So, in general terms, 
Ultima Thule is from the earliest moments in our solar system, four and a half billion years ago. It is part of the cold classical Kuiper Belt objects, meaning that these objects we do not believe have suffered any significant changes in the period of time since they formed four and a half billion years ago. Primarily associated with rocky material with a lot of volatiles, that's ices like methane, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, water, all frozen together. Uh, no atmosphere, not a surprise. No satellites. Yeah, some people were expecting sort of satellite companions, but we've not detected any at this point in time. No ring structure. In fact, one of the biggest concerns of flying so close to Ultima Thule, we were within about 3,100 kilometers of it, is that if there was any leftover debris that was still gravitationally tagged to Ultima Thule, New Horizons might have plowed straight into it. And okay, it might have only been a few grams, but traveling at 50,000 kilometers an hour, even a few grams can do some serious damage to the spacecraft. Nothing of that happened. So no rings, no companions, no atmosphere, no surprise at this point in time. All of the data analysis uh, will be done from the ground. We just need the data to come back to us. And as I said, that's going to take about 20 months to happen. How did it form? We suspect along these lines. In the earliest days of the solar nebula, that is to say, as our sun was coalescing at the center of this very large flattened cloud of material, and as we moved outwards from the sun, we had planetesimals that were forming and slowly accreting, bumping into each other, sticking together. Then as they got larger, gravitationally attracting more material, this is the way planets form. In the inner solar system where the terrestrial worlds happen, that is rich in what we refer to as the refractory elements, the material that has high melting points, high boiling points. Once you get beyond the asteroid belt, it's pretty chilly out there. The amount of gaseous material, volatile materials like hydrogen, water vapor, methane, ammonia, that goes up a lot. And so therefore, there's a richer cloud of material to help form the gas giants. But all throughout, there remain these small little pieces of material that will accrete together and form. They don't necessarily have to be vacuumed up by the larger planetesimals. And out in the Kuiper Belt, well beyond the gas giants, we suspect that there was a large amount of material that formed in the vicinity of tens of kilometers in size, but because they were so separated from their companions, because there was no gravitational incentive from the gas giants, they just hung out. And we suspect that that's how most of the Kuiper Belt materials formed. And because nothing has been going on out there, they're pristine, they're time capsules, they're waiting for us to have a look. And so we suspect that over here on the left, material that was just slowly and quietly accreting together eventually created two relatively large masses of material, which gravitationally bound together, but quietly over tens of thousands, maybe millions of years, quietly circled in and eventually came together. So we're not talking about a crashing encounter. We're literally just talking about a slow dance and a coalescence. And that bright ring of material that I was pointing out to you before, we suspect is the accumulation of material, gravel material, if you will, that was on Ultima and Thule that slowly slid down to the, the joining point over time, probably much more icy in nature, and hence why it appears whiter with higher reflectivity. But these objects are probably literally just more or less sitting there but there's no reason for them not to do anything else. That is to say, the gravitational attraction is enough to keep them there, and over time, material is just built up around the neck. But it, not, it likely didn't form as one object that way. It likely formed this way, which was the prevailing theory associated with planetesimal accretion in our outer solar system. So this is yet another vindication, if you will, of the nebula hypothesis, which talks about the formation processes of planets in planetary systems. We have seen this type of structure before. For those of you who remember back to the Rosetta mission and Comet Churyumov Gasmarenko, it, it actually had the title of the rubber ducky, not the snowman. And 
this was about four kilometers in size, but the structure should look surprisingly familiar to you. And then if you go back to the uh, uh, to the, uh, Comet Hartley, this was the um, uh, deep impact mission that was renamed uh, uh, Epoxy. Same sort of double lobe structure. So these types of objects are actually quite common in our solar system. What's next? Well, the onboard plutonium power supply should be able to continue generating energy for New Horizons and its transmitter, it's only a 12 watt transmitter, deep into the 2030s. After that, there's likely to be insufficient power to both motivate instrument gathering, you know, data gathering, and transmit back to Earth. So we technically have probably another 10 to 15 years worth of powered life aboard New Horizons. We have still the better part of 20 kilograms of onboard fuel because the corrections that took us from Pluto on to Ultima Thule were so well done that we just about didn't expend any more than the primary burn. So if we can find another target that is more or less on the flight path at the moment and New Horizons does have escape velocity, it will cross the heliopause, it will join Voyagers 1 and 2 in the region beyond the governance of our sun, that's still quite a ways away, but over the next 10 years if we can find an object that is more or less on the flight path and we can just tweak the trajectory with the remaining fuel on board, then we can do a repeat performance, an encore if you will, of the flyby of Ultima Thule. And so that's what everybody is pushing for. The spacecraft is in great health at this point in time. The expectation is that NASA will extend the mission beyond 2021, they haven't yet, of course, the government's got to be functional for that to happen. But uh, did I say that out loud? Uh, so <laughs> at this point in time, there is an expectation that we will find an object more or less on the flight path and that New Horizons will be healthy enough to go and visit and there will be an extension of the funding to go off and do it. So with a bit of luck, come back here in three, four, five years and do the same again as far as another Kuiper Belt encounter is concerned. Thank you. Okay. What's RTG? Ray, what is RTG? Sorry, radio isotope thermoelectric generator. What does that mean? Uh, it basically means we've got a plutonium power source which is radioactively decaying. Therefore, it's generating heat, and that heat is being converted into electricity. So, so all oh yeah, <laughs> all of the space probes beyond the orbit of the asteroid belt, with the exception of Juno have all been powered by RTGs. The Curiosity rover has an RTG on board so that you, know, you don't have to rely on solar panels and you only have to ask Opportunity how good a plan that is. Yep. Paul, what, what is the mechanism that makes the um, two bodies actually spiral into each other? Because I know our moon is actually moving away from us due to tidal interaction, so I'm interested in what's happening there. Quite true. The moon is moving away from the Earth courtesy of friction between the ocean and the ocean floor. That's robbing our planet of a little bit of rotational energy and something called the conservation of angular momentum demands that the, uh, the conservation is maintained. If we're slowing our rotation rate down, the separation between the Earth and the moon has to increase to keep the angular momentum constant. So there is a, a frictional force that is interacting on the Earth which is causing that phenomenon. What we suspect happened in the case of Ultima Thule is that material began to accrete and coalesce and these objects were close enough that there was a gravitational engagement. So the objects are moving around the sun, they're accreting, they're getting larger, their gravitational attraction is increasing and that begins to pull them together. But they don't necessarily come together like this, they have their own motion around the sun. So as their gravitational force got sufficient that they were trapped with each other, so as to speak, they literally just fell into an orbit and then the expectation is that with time, they just slowed down courtesy of further collisions, which robbed them of some energy, 
and they just quietly spiraled in, a little bit like what we've seen with neutron stars and black holes dancing together. Probably the same sorts of timelines, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, but they would not have been moving very fast. And so as a consequence of their literally slow waltz together, they just got closer and closer and closer and then sort of you know, came together and stayed that way. And that would generate, of course, the uh, rotation rate that we're seeing today. Remember I said they're rotating about every 15 hours? That will be a leftover residual of that dance that brought them together. You don't uh, want to wait for the pub? <laughs> um, I'm curious to know if when the two bodies get together, this sort of follow up from Ed's, when the two bodies start to touch, do they somehow glue themselves together or are they solely held by gravity and then there's a follow up after that? We think it's just gravity. By the time they got around to doing this, we were pretty sure they were solid material. So this wasn't happening during their sort of uh, molten liquid stage. We suspect that they were quite solid as they rotated in towards each other. So a little bit like sort of parking a car and getting a little bit too close to the car that's, as you're backing into it. That, that's more or less the speed that we're suspicious of. And they, they, you know, friction eventually would have stopped their, their, their slide across each other. But you know, we've got an object that is roughly 20 kilometers in size and 10 kilometers in size. When they're that close, there's enough mutual gravity to keep them together. So is there any chance that three bodies could get together in a line yep. and possibly explain Oumuamua, the uh, object from the other solar system that was very long and narrow? The answer, as I understand it, and I'm, I'm not a dynamicist, but from what I have read, the answer is yes. Is it going to happen often? The answer is no, because there's, there's too many other things that will happen, including ejecting the smaller particle away from the larger two. But when we're talking about truly millions, if not more, you know, particles in the outer solar system, you can have almost any combination come together and create almost any uh, type of formation. So yes is the answer, but is it going to be particularly common? I wouldn't think. Question from online. Uh, will the James Webb Telescope give us the deeper reach we need uh, into the outer fringes of our solar system? It certainly will. The problem is there are about 3,227,000 projects that the James Webb Telescope has queued up at this point in time. Uh, and so the amount of time that they're going to have to look at the outer solar system is going to be precious little. And that's assuming we get it up sometime this millennia. Uh, so at the moment, it's scheduled for 2021. Six meter diameter mirror out where it is, optimized for the infrared. You know, it is definitely going to give us more insight into the outer solar system and the Kuiper Belt objects, but it's probably not going to be a high priority target, at least in the first year or two, I wouldn't think. And as I say, you know, there's, you know, being perfectly serious, there's lots of projects that we want Kep uh, Kepler, that we want uh, James Webb to do, so pick a number, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and another question is, so will the system grow, uh, referring to uh, Thule, um, Will the system grow as it collides with other dust or smaller particles and fill in the neck? No, because the, the amount of material that is now out there is so far apart that the collision, the possibility of further collisions is really, really minuscule. It's not zero, but in the early days of the solar system, as material was condensing out, that was when you had you know, pockets of material that formed most of that pocket probably came together to form Ultima and Thule with just a little bit of leftover. That leftover material has probably rained down onto the objects over the four and a half billion years of intervening time, rolled down to the center. There would be precious little else out there at this point in time. And the separation between Ultima Thule and all the other objects is we're, we're talking literally millions of kilometers. So no, they're not likely to grow. Any other questions? <laughs> she knows. <laughs> I, I was wondering if uh, a, a planet like Pluto and its moon Ceres could fuse together. Or are, is it too large? Or is there a threshold where it can't happen? Um, 
I guess technically, if you had two objects that were series in size that were close enough together, they could form this sort of contact binary type of object. Uh, most of this action has to happen shortly after the sun fires up its nuclear furnace when it's in a relatively molten state uh, and things can flow around the place. Once the sun fires up its furnace, it tends to blow the material away from the solar system. The gas and the dust gets sort of distributed even further out. So if objects don't form particularly close because of their relatively weak gravity, they're not going to come together. Conversely, if they are particularly close, then if they're in their molten state, the chances of them fusing together and becoming one larger object is, is reasonably high. So in the case of, uh, of Ceres, there's nothing that's particularly big anywhere near it, suggesting that its self-gravity pulled in its nearby stuff and the material that was further out just didn't have an opportunity to rain down onto Ceres' surface. But technically, yes, you could have a couple of larger objects if the formation conditions were right, they solidify and then they gravitationally sort of you know, coalesce uh, into sort of a contact binary object. But again, a little bit like uh, the earlier question, the chances of those sorts of things happening are pretty slim. Okay. Hi. Um, when it does its flyby or has to turn around and look, uh, transmit back to Earth, is it using a bit of fuel as it does all of those? Uh, on the on, uh, my understanding is that there are reaction wheels on board that that uh, take up most of that orientation. So there would be precious little fuel that is being used for that. But th that's a good question. I is there being fuel used? There's probably a touch of it, but that's why we put reaction wheels on vehicles so that they can turn without the loss of fuel. And when it does a flyby, is it actually panning the? Just keep it going. Now that is that, that is actually utilizing fuel because the reaction wheels can't change quickly enough to do those sorts of engagements. Absolutely, uh, and it, it's all calibrated. You know, we we know exactly how fast we ex know how far away we know where it is. Those calculations are done you know ad nauseum many times by many people to make sure that the pan rate is in fact right, because the last thing you want to do is say, oh, we blew it, we've got to go back and do it, because that's not going to happen, okay? So yeah, that, that type of calculation is done incessantly uh, to make sure we've got it right. And of course, then you've got to worry about the illumination uh, and so on and so forth. So yeah, the spacecraft is really calibrated to do all of that almost instantaneously and all done by remote control. And you don't want it to go into safe mode when you're doing that. So, <laughs> uh, could particle waves uh, possibly uh, create episodes of uh, enough energy to drive objects together in the Kuiper Belt? Probably not. Uh, again, the density of material, so you're talking about back four and a half billion years ago, um, the, the density out there of particles per cubic centimeter, meter, kilometer, uh, and so it really is very low. So it's, it's really a matter more of the distribution of material in the solar nebula and where it was dense enough to coalesce and start the process of accretion. Uh, my bet is that there is still out in the reaches of the Kuiper Belt so much separation between material that the notion of sort of a particle wave, uh, you know, changing the dynamic activity of the other particles out there, I suspect the answer is no. It, it, it really is low density stuff that we're talking about. And that, that's why there's so much material that is, you know, a few kilometers to a few tens of kilometers. That's why we don't have a lot of Pluto sized objects out there. Pluto and Eris probably are as large as they're going to get, although Mike Brown is looking for, again, a 10 earth mass object there. It, it really is replaying what we were thinking of back in 1930. Uh, he might be right, uh, but the chances seem to me to be fairly slim that there are those sorts of objects out there, given the density profile of material that we find. Another question from the net is, are there any projects to go out perpendicular to the ecliptic to see what's out in those regions? Hmm. 
Not that I'm aware of. The only spacecraft that has ever gone out of the ecliptic plane in any significant way was a spacecraft by the name of Ulysses. Uh, and it was designed to fly over the poles of the sun in the 1990s. So we deliberately sent Ulysses out to Jupiter and then its gravitational assist literally took it out of the ecliptic. And Ulysses then spent 12 years, 14 years, might have even been longer, flying over the north and south poles of the sun. I think it did at least two, if not three, complete flybys. Uh, so that is the only spacecraft that has gone somewhat out of the ecliptic plane. To the best of my knowledge, there is no uh, planned mission that will go, as you say, perpendicular to the ecliptic plane. Any other questions? So, okay, I'm going okay. that way. All right. Well, I'd certainly uh, uh, like to say that uh, Paul has given us a great talk on the uh, New Horizons mission. And uh, judging from the uh, questions that we've got, there's a lot of interest. and. So it will be interesting to see how uh, things unfold in about 20 months time or so as the uh, data set uh, comes in and gets processed. So thank you very much, Paul, for uh, a really interesting talk. And we wish you safe travels. And we look forward to seeing you back here as uh, the, the um, uh, Vice President for Programming, uh, introducing our guest speakers uh, next September. Thank you again. <laughs> OK, so I think uh, we're going to uh, now go into the uh, announcements. So just bear with us while we get that up. Let's take a look at what's coming up over the next few weeks. <clears throat> so tonight was uh, an example of a speaker's night uh, program. Our next meeting in two weeks is what we call recreational astronomy uh, night, where we have some uh, informal presentations by individual members. Program for uh, the 30th of January, two weeks' time from today. Uh, we'll have Andy Beaton doing the sky this month, where he'll be talking about the um, uh, what's uh, going on in the sky over the next four weeks from then. Uh, Blake Nancro will be uh, talking about outreach at the David Dunlap Observatory. And then we have Henry Lowton, who will be coming in to speak to us about a new planetarium proposal for Toronto. Uh, many of you will recall that uh, back in the uh, uh, 1970s through the mid-1990s, the, McLa the McLaughlin Planetarium was operating at the Royal Ontario Museum. It was shut down in uh, 1996, which resulted in us moving up here to uh, have our meetings here, here at the Science Center. Well, uh, there have been a number of these programs uh, or uh, proposed uh, planetarium projects over the years. And uh, Henry uh, is uh, heading up the latest uh, effort to get a large planetarium in the Toronto region. So he'll be coming to talk to us about that and uh, seeing what we can do to maybe help out with that. Uh, the next meeting after that uh, will be our next speaker's night uh, on 13th of February. And uh, Mike Watson, who uh, many of you have seen come here to talk about the sky this month over the last couple of years, is going to be talking about the 1979 total solar eclipse. and. Uh, this image here is of uh, yours truly, among others, shivering in the cold on the uh, uh, tarmac at the Gimli Airport uh, in front of our two DC-3s. Uh, 
but we flew from Toronto uh, to uh, Gimli to observe that eclipse. And Mike was the organizer of the expedition, and he's going to be talking about uh, the preparations and how uh, the whole thing unfolded, and uh, uh, also hopefully will uh, be able to uh, show us some of the images that were taken that day. So, uh, yes. That's right. Randy Atwood, who is also on the trip, um, is going to be debuting a new video uh, of um, the eclipse expedition and the observations. So uh, that should be quite interesting. Hard to believe that's 40 years ago. Uh, oh my. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I just remember it was awfully cold out there, and the problem was trying to figure out whether the film had broken in the camera or not. Uh, so anyway, it was a memorable trip, and all of my eclipse expeditions since then have been to considerably warmer circumstances. Okay, uh, other things going on over the next few weeks. Uh, our next uh, public solar observing uh, program will be on Saturday, the 2nd of February, uh, out on the telescope. And uh, as usual, uh, Sean is going to be organizing that and will give the go or no go announcement on uh, the forum, as well as uh, having that posted on Twitter, the Facebook page, and so on. And uh, again, we'll be looking for people to help out with uh, showing the sun to the uh, public between 10 and 12 noon uh, on that day. If it's cloudy that day, our backup date is the following uh, Saturday, the 9th of February. Also, uh, our regularly observed, uh, our regularly scheduled observing programs, we have the uh, next dark sky star party at Long Sioux Conservation Area, uh, be the first clear night of the week of uh, the 4th of February. So Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday night, of course, because the Wednesday night we've got a meeting. It'll probably be clear that night, uh, just like tonight. Uh, and then the following week will be the City Star Party uh, being held at Bayview Village Park. And uh, again, for both of these events, there will be a go, no-go uh, call made on each of the days in question until we either run out of time or actually have a clear night to observe. Okay, we do have another outreach event coming up at the Science Center on Saturday, 9th of February. This will be the second of the three uh, winter uh, evening observing programs here at the Science Center. We had a very successful one uh, the, uh, just Saturday night. Uh, we had four people outside with telescopes and three of us inside uh, talking to the general public as they left the Science Center. And I think uh, Rachel says we, we probably managed to uh, show the moon and Mars to about two or 300 people as they were uh, leaving after a day here at the Science Center. And we're hoping to be able to do the same thing on the 9th of February uh, as well. So uh, again, we'll be looking to uh, get some assistance with that between uh, 6 and 8 p.m. on that Saturday night. and There will be more information posted on the forum as we come closer to that date. Uh, just a reminder that even though the road is closed, the uh, car observatory is available for your use, and um, you just have to remember that it's the winter access uh, rule now. The road itself is impassable, but you park on the, uh, uh, on the road at the top of the hill, and then walk in with your supplies and so on, and you can book uh, online and also uh, pick up a uh, set of keys from uh, a number of designated points across the GTA. And uh, again, it's a, an opportunity to get into some uh, dark skies during the winter months. Also a reminder that one of your membership benefits is the telescope loan program where you can uh, get a loan of uh, equipment for a couple of weeks at no charge. It's a membership benefit. And uh, we have at least one of our uh, program managers here, Mark Teitelbaum. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, talking with Mark about uh, borrowing some equipment, please uh, feel free to talk with him. 
Okay, and finally, meeting after the meeting, uh, uh, going to the Granite Brew Pub at Eglinton East at Mount Pleasant, Park Underground, and uh, we'll see you there uh, in the back room. So, uh, just a reminder that we still have a few 2019 observers cal uh, calendars available for sale, uh, and uh, uh, you can get them uh, tonight. And uh, I guess that's it for this meeting. Uh, Paul. Ah, yes, thank you. Yeah. We will be observing. Okay. <laughs> Let me try that again. Uh, Sunday evening from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. on top of the Arboretum Parking Arcade, Main York University campus. We'll have a number of uh, portable telescopes in our 40 centimeter out there uh, telling people what is happening and during totality, weather permitting of course, uh, we'll do a bit of a constellation sky tour as well. So as I say, dress for the weather. The forecast is uh, negative plenty. Uh, anywhere from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. main your campus. Uh, there were some questions about uh, whether we'd be doing anything here at the Science Center for the eclipse and the answer is no. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it's so late after uh, the Science Center closes that evening uh, that uh, there wouldn't be any uh, way to organize anything uh, at this location. So we're just going to be going with uh, 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 the public program up at York University and hopefully we'll have some views that evening. But uh, just watch out for the forecasts. Uh, it's highly changeable at this point, so uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, but so much for the super blood wolf moon or whatever it is. Uh, we've had a whole flurry of uh, uh, requests for radio interviews uh, that uh, started coming in today. And so Paul's already uh, had an awful lot of uh, uh, interviews. Uh, CBC is apparently trying to set something up nationwide and I think Chris Vaughn uh, dealt with a couple of interviews today as well so thank you very much for your help with that and uh, well we'll see what happens on uh, Sunday night so uh, clear skies and we'll see you at the next meeting in a couple of weeks <laughs>